Well, let's dig into Job. So we got um, our last set of arguments, really. So Bildad has the shortest chapter in Job. Then Job takes a really long, lengthy defense plus kind of a summary. And then we have Elihu comes up and makes an even longer speech before the Lord uh, steps in and straightens it out. So we're going to cover some chapters with a lot of speech. Speed, but hopefully it shouldn't be that confusing because again because of the poetry of what's going on um, it's it's more about the larger message than about the minutia so with that would someone volunteer to read uh, job 25 it's only six verses sure. thank you and bill Dad, the shoe height responded dominion and all belong to him who makes peace in his heights is there any number to his troops and upon who does his light not rise? How then can mankind be righteous with God? Or how can anyone who is born of woman be pure? Even if the moon has no brightness and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man, the maggot, and a son of man, that worm? <laughs> yeah. So, as we can see, the arguments are kind of petering out, and that's going we'll see why Elihu steps in. But, I think we've all been a part of discussions or arguments that just get to that point where it's stale. Everything that you've thought or that you can think of has already been said. And so uh, Bildad's kind of final argument goes out with a bit of a puff. It's really not that, uh, not that profound. It certainly doesn't add anything. But we do note, again, that they had um, a pretty, some pretty solid ideas about God. They were just misapplying it. So this idea that of de- dominion and fear or awe belonging to him and he makes his peace in the high places. So this idea, or, or rather, this enforces the biblical idea that one, of course, God has ultimate sovereignty or dominion over everything, that everything is ultimately responsible to him, which is true, and that the fear of God is, is uh, owed to him, and that means that reverent respect and recognition for what he is. And then <clears throat> the fact that he makes peace in his high places is really interesting because uh, when we look at this, all of this is happening because there was a lack of peace in the heavenlies, right? Because of Satan's assault on God and specifically his assault on, uh, on, on Job kind of by way of trying to get at God, um, that God is actually going to bring so- resolution to that situation as well. But fascinatingly, as we see when God finally uh, starts to resolve this, he doesn't really... Aff- uh, tell much about what's going on in the heavenlies. He just deals with the revelation of himself. Anyway, um, we also would point out, right, that he says that he's got these unlimited angelic armies, God that is, and who does, who, upon whom his light does not rise, uh, this idea that God is the source of, of all light and revelation. And then he goes back to his same argument, which is how can any of us be okay before God? And it's kind of a fascinating thing because all of Job's friends seem to have this self-righteousness. Like, well, we're okay with God. God obviously just doesn't like you because of whatever it is that you did. Um, So it's it's a fascinating double standard. And essentially, they've been argued out. And so then they're just down to, well, why would God care about man, a maggot? Which I love that because at one point when I was teaching the, uh, the youth class, I said, what do your kid, where do your parents call you? Like, what pet names do you have? And Brianna said, maggots. And I realized, that was Matt. <laughs> I think it was, you know, more endearing somehow within that household. But this is, a, this is kind of an interesting point because could we say that man is a maggot and a worm in reference to God's absolute greatness and goodness? Yeah, that's maybe not, that's not an unfair comparison he is so much greater he is so much holier he is so much more glorious and yet on the other side we can also say that god is not or man is not a maggot or a worm because man is made in the image of god we're going to point out that god cares so much for humanity that he comes down as as, in the person of jesus christ and dies for our sins obviously while we are certainly worthy of all judgment and destruction it seems as if this philosophy or theology that Bildad and the others really have come about really doesn't recognize God's love relationship for mankind. 
It doesn't really recognize how much he's interested in us and how much he's willing to sacrifice for us, as we'll see. So that kind of goes out with a puff and brings us into Job's answer. And the fun thing about this is, while Bildad's argument really doesn't ha- have much to say, he doesn't even you know, make much of a direct accusation like they have in the past. He just lets it go. Um, but Job answers, and uh, Cadence, do you want to read Job 26? One through eight. But Job answered and said, How have you helped him who is without power? How have you saved your arm that has no strength? How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared some advice to many? To whom have you uttered words and whose spirit is with you? Actually, stop right there. That's perfect. Okay, so um, Job now, for the first, well, kind of for the first time, cuts back. Because, you know, that he hasn't, really said much more to them than, hey, what you're saying is wrong and you're just being stubborn and rude and not being very nice. But now he goes a step further and says, what have you done? Like, what have you done to help people? He's going to go back and defend himself later. But he starts off by pointing out uh, Job here has is without power. He's without strength. He's been absolutely decimated by the Lord. And he's saying, what have you done to help me? What have you done to minister to me? What have you done to serve me? And, and then he takes that as a, as kind of a, a, a jumping off point to say, what have you done for anybody? And it's really you know, fascinating how much a person can be blessed as these friends of his were and still really not choose to help a single other person, right? And so he's turned the tables on them and pointing out like, you're claiming to be so self-righteous and so much better than me because I'm suffering under this apparent judgment of God. We know it wasn't really a judgment of God. But you don't, you're not here to help at all. You're just here to kick me while I'm down. And then he moves on and he says, The dead tremble, and under those waters those inhabiting Sheol is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. He stretches out the north over empty spaces. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken up. Under it, he covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters and the boundary of light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and the astonished and are astonished at his rebuke. He stirs up the sea with his power, and by his understanding he breaks up the storm. His he- spirit, by his spirit, he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Indeed, they, these are the mere edges of his ways. How small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? So, Job's been asking a lot of serious questions, right? He's been asking, where is God? Why is this happening? How could he let this happen? But now he's coming back and reaffirming some things about God. He's saying, you guys want to make me the heretic for asking, but I'm in a really unique situation. And so he's affirming what he knows about God. And this is going to be really important for the structure of the book because God is about to uh, hold everybody accountable for their words and, and respond to all their words, right? So um, do any of the things that he says in verses 5 through the end of chapter stand out to you as being particularly interesting? The things that God does, or that Job says that God does. Ooh, yeah, isn't that a great statement? What does that sound like? What? What? Any time we hear about a serpent in in Scripture, where does that take us to? Yeah. So he is uh, take. It's going. Yeah. It's talking about God's judgment upon G- on Satan, about God's ultimate judgment over evil. As we've seen, uh, we've used the, the term Rahab, the Leviathan. There's been all sorts of serpent imagery throughout this, and God is always the master over it. And so here we have this picture of Job saying, I know that God judged the evil one, the fleeing serpent. I know that God uh, is ultimately in charge here. He also makes some really interesting statements that are shocking in light of when this book was written. Uh, talking about how he stretches the north over empty out, so he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, every other ancient mythology would have the earth on the back of a turtle or being held by Atlas or something like that. However, 
what we see here is that God hangs the earth on absolutely nothing. Isn't that an amazing thing? How long did it take us to scientifically understand that? Years, right? I mean, millennia until we finally understand that, that, that the earth isn't hanging by something or supported by anything, but rather is just suspended. How could Job have had access to that information? It's impossible, except by divine revelation. The Lord is revealing to him. Um, the Lord has revealed to him and revealed, obviously, the ancient world. Th- those that uh, knew him and retained the knowledge of God had an idea that this was all these other ancient weird mythologies about what holds up the earth were all untrue and that the Lord was able to actually just suspend it in nothing. It's kind of amazing to think, right? As we take the cosmos very much for granted and our you know, heliocentric solar system and all this. But Job spoke about it before it was even... Uh, before we even would have thought of that, right? We also have that he uh, binds up the water in his thick clouds, and yet the clouds are not broken under it. So he uh, references the water cycle and the Lord's control of the water cycle, covers his face and throne. Um, he drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters. Um, there, there's disagreement about this, but this is, seems very much to indicate a round earth. Yes, I, I do think that too. Yeah, so... Here's Job again. We just want to point out that this very ancient book, that by all rights, shouldn't have anything that matches our modern scientific worldview or discoveries, and yet that's precisely what we have it uh, pointed out these boundaries of light and darkness. Think about that the boundary of light and darkness. I mean, well, most people would, again, most ancient people groups would have, you know, the flat earth and the sun going over it and lighting it in the daytime, and then it's dark because the sun got put out or whatever else happened they believe about it. But what do we have? You know, as you watch the world turn from a great distance, you see the the boundary between light and dark constantly moving over the earth. And he had a picture of that in his mind. Why? Because of Genesis, undoubtedly, and going forward um, with whatever revelation he might have received. Uh, he stirs up the sea with his power, and by his understanding, he breaks up the storm. So give, uh, giving unto the Lord credit for the uh, power or authority over the weather cycle. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens and pierced the fleeing servants. So this idea of adorning the heavens, again, probably is not just thinking about the physical heavens, but also of the angelic world. So he has um, adorned the, the heavens and all those angelic beings that are contained within it. And as we pointed out, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. In other words, those rebellious angelic magistries are uh, yet under his judgment and control or power, authority, maybe is a better way to put it. Indeed, they're mere edges of his ways. How small a whisper we, are, uh, we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? So, did Job have an orthodox understanding of God and his might and his power? Yeah. Now, this is an interesting, another interesting thing that the, uh, the secularists will sometimes put forth is the idea that first there was polytheism and then monotheism emerged. But what we see from this very, very ancient writing is the absolute reality that monotheism was always the original and polytheism, or the worship of many gods, was the perversion. And so this is kind of a stick in the eye to all those who would try to claim some kind of develop, religious development bringing forth a monotheistic religion. In term, uh, the reality is, is that um, Job has a very established perspective that God is truly sovereign, other, the God of all, and all these other angelic beings, they answer to him. They're not equal in authority. They're not in any way his uh, others that are just like him. They're entirely under his control. Yeah, he's real excited. There you go. Okay. So, we get, moreover, Job continued his discourse. And it's interesting, because the old King James, at each of these turns, where it says, moreover, Job continued his discourse, it says, Job continues his parables. And so it's along this idea that Job is basically giving this sermon. And we want to remind you that nothing has changed. The Lord hasn't yet taken away any of his sicknesses, any of the things that, afflictions that happened to him. And yet, this is a, an incre- incredibly faithful description. Job is 
suffering well because of the doctrine, because of the belief, the knowledge of God that he had built within his soul. And so even when everything went haywire, we know now above all, because up until now, Job's mostly been complaining and not whining, but complaining justly and asking God why and asking for an answer, right? And his friends have been totally useless trying to just say, well, you sinned, you sinned, you sinned, you sinned, you sinned. He's going, I... Anyway, he's going to defend that. But we want to point out that this is Job's statement of his belief in God, and it is beyond um, it is beyond orthodox. It sets up an understanding that um, they didn't that Job didn't move from some primordial belief system, but rather had the biblical idea of God as He revealed Himself from the very beginning. So this is not uh, we have to note that the world or the secular historians have it absolutely wrong because they're not basing their knowledge on the Word of God. Make sense? So then Job continues his discourse. Does someone want to pick up Job 27, 3 through 12? Or 3, 1 through 12. 27, 1 through 12. Okay. Thank you. And Job continued his discourse. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made my life bitter... As long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit you are in the right. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. May my enemy be like the wicked, my adverse adversary like the unjust. For what hope have the godless when they are cut off, when God takes away their life? Does God listen to their cry when, the, when distress comes upon them? Will they find delight in the Almighty? Will they call on God at all times? I will teach about. I will teach you about the power of God. The ways of the Almighty I will not conceal. You have all seen this yourselves. Why then this meaningless talk? Awesome. So, um, Job is continuing his plaint, a complaint against God, right? As God lives, who has taken away my justice and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter. So he recognizes that God is involved. Now, we'd say a larger bit of perspective would let us know that who is it that actually caused this against him? Satan, Satan right? So Satan is really the one. However, we can't say that Job's exactly wrong, right? Because why? How? what allowed Satan to do this to him? Yeah, God gave him permission. So he's pointing out here, and I love this. It's really so incredible. He points out, like, the only way I know to understand this is God brought this suffering upon me, or at least God allowed this suffering upon me. My soul made my soul bitter. This idea that my whole life is bitter is the the concept context here. He's not saying, um, like, that he's bitter, although he has every right to be, but he's talking about the bitterness of his existence as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. It's amazing. So he's endured all of this and endured all of the persecution or you know poor comfort of his friends and he still insists that he's not going to speak deceit. He's not going to swear or speak against God. Um, I think that this really gives us an appreciation for how godly Job really is, right? I mean, how many of us in a time of difficulty or adversity are tempted to comfort ourselves with sin or comfort ourselves with, well, God let me down, so I'm going to go my way. It's a pretty common way to think tragically, isn't it? Maybe it shouldn't be, right? Can you think of any smaller ways that we do that? Like we probably, you probably didn't go off to, what's that? Chocolate. That is exactly it. Yeah, exactly. Like the Lord's allowed this to be the worst day ever. I need chocolate. Can you think of any other ways? Just, uh, we don't take the time to learn His Word, maybe, and just just find excuses to not, and just like watch TV and zone out on that instead of having to think about God. That's awesome. Yeah. Eh, I don't I don't know if I want to read God's word or come to it's been a tough day. It's been a terrible week. I'm not going to church. I need to sleep in. God's not a comfort to me. I uh, I need to 
again, whatever, sleep in, watch TV, do whatever our thing is. Now, I'm not saying that there's not certain situations where we might need to sleep in or need to miss church. So I'm not trying to turn this into some sort of like attendance guilt fest. But the real... Sorry about that. But the but the real the reality is is you know when we instead of looking to the Lord for comfort look to control of schedule or like for me it's being cranky grouchy push like just bad language throwing and just bad attitude about everyone around me like get out of my way I've had a bad day right I deserve to be left alone or I deserve to be uh, whatever it is isn't that kind of yeah kind of like what he's the opposite rather of what Job is so beautifully demonstrating here. He's saying the Lord has allowed my life to become horrifying and very difficult, but I'm not going to let my lips speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. It's something, right? That's a pretty remarkable uh, example for us to see and to live up to. And then he goes on to say, and you could read this wrong, but I think it's very clear that he means it in a correct way. Far be it for me that I should say that you're right Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. Now, see, this is actually a huge, huge deal. Job is not willing to admit guilt in this situation. Why? Because he's not. not. Now, wait a minute. Haven't they all agreed that everyone's sinful and everyone sins? How could he say he's not? How could he even make that claim? He knows, exactly, high five, boom. He, he knows that he's goofed up, but he was r- rightly related through God, to God through his sacrifices, through his relationship with God. See, this is, again, explosively large and should be explosively large in our mind because when the enemy stands up against you and convicts you and, and tries to accuse you, whether in your mind's eye or on the heavenly courtroom, what do you say in return? We need to rely upon the completed work of Jesus Christ. I know that this is not for eternal sin, that I have not sinned, because I know that I'm forgiven by Jesus Christ. We so frequently will second-guess ourselves. Did I sin? Did I do too much? And even believers who are sometimes well-instructed in the Word will wonder if they lost their salvation because of sins or failures or whatever it is. But the reality is, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to purify us from our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that or not? You see, Job did. Job was absolutely convinced that there was nothing to be laid before him. Or, in other words, whatever sins that he had committed before, God had already forgiven by his grace through uh, the relationship that he had through him with sacrifice, right? Job is not being arrogant. Job is theologically and doctrinally convinced of his right relationship with God, and he's right. It's important that we as believers have that same absolute confidence. Again, not in ourselves, not self-righteously, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. And our tragically pagan hearts will always lean back or fall back on, well, maybe we're wrong. Maybe there is a sin that I can't that I've committed that God won't forgive or can't forgive. Or maybe, or maybe, or maybe. But Job isn't backing down one inch because he knows, based on what God has revealed to him, that he's in a right relationship with God. And he knows that his accusers aren't or his would-be comforters, but they're not playing the role of comforter, they're playing the role of Satan. This is exactly what Satan does on the heavenly seen towards us any time we're walking in sin. He accuses us, tries to get us to lose heart, to despair. And we need to stand on the doctrine of the completed work of Jesus Christ and say, I I cannot put away my integrity. There is no sin that hasn't been forgiven by Jesus Christ, by by faith in him. So, He says, to my righteousness I hold fast and will not let go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Oh, but he still has this situation in his life uh, that is painful, and he's trying to figure this out. He says, may my enemy be like the wicked, and he who rises up against me like the unrighteous. 
For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much if God take away his life? Will God hear his cry when his trouble comes upon him? Will he delight in himself and the Almighty, or will he call on God? So here, Job is pointing out something. He says, you guys have all been looking at my outward situation, the, the, the hardship that's come on me, and you've pronounced it the judgment of God. But let me tell you, I have hope in God. When the hypocrite and the unrighteous are judged, they have no hope in God. They try and find hope in themselves, hope in their pleasures, hope in whatever power that they can draw. But he's saying, I am here continually throwing my, casting my anxieties, my fears, my cares, begging of God. So would I do that if I was unrighteous? Of course I wouldn't. My complaint wouldn't be against God. My complaint would be against whatever else. Um, so he's pointing out that his attitude throughout this points to his unwavering faith in the goodness and the love and the righteousness and justice of God. He just wants to understand how. But his friends don't get it, right? His friends don't get it. So then he says, and this again sounds might sound a little bit arrogant to us until we understand the context, I will teach you about the hand of God, with, uh, what is with the Almighty I will not conceal. Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you be, uh, behave with complete nonsense? So, He's pointing out, you're trying to arrogantly teach me about God, but I'm teaching you about God through this situation. And so true it is. We don't learn much about God, really. We only learn mostly about error from Job's friends. But we learn about the character of God through Job's struggle. And Job is showing them how to deal with uh, hard situations and hardships, right? Right? He cries out. He says some things that are even a little bit shocking and a little bit surprising. But God seems to be okay with that. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that Job is a positive example of suffering, even when he said some things that are borderline? Well, he understands the character of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when, he's, when he doesn't understand, he's asking questions. He's not saying, you know, God's wicked and evil. He's constantly framing it as a, God, I need to figure out how to reconcile the information and the things going on in my life with what I know about your character, right? So God is big enough to handle our questions and our despair and our fear and our complaints. And here's the point. If this had happened to, to one of his friends, then they probably would have just shut off their gumball machine God and saying, God is not worth listening to. He's not worth paying attention to. It doesn't pay out. But Job doesn't do that. Job doesn't go try to find another God, find another religion, turn in or cash in his ideas on God. No, nope. he is going to show that his faithfulness and constant belief in God, even through his trial, is a picture of what real spiritual maturity looks like. Uh, does someone want to read 13 through 23? Okay. Here is the fate God allots to the wicked. The heritage a ruthless man receives from the Almighty. However many cho- his children, their fate is the sword. His offsprings, offspring will never have enough to eat. The plague will bury those who survive him, and their widows will not weep for them. Though he heaps up silver like dust and clothes like piles of clay, while he lays up the righteous will wear, and the innocent will divide his silver. The house he builds is like a moth cocoon, like a hut made by a watchman. He lies down wealthy, but will do so no more. When he opens his eyes, all is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest snatches him away in the night. The east wind carries him off, and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls itself against him without mercy, as he flees headlong from its power. It claps its hands in derision and hisses him out of his place. Place. Good, yeah. So um, it's interesting because you can almost highlight or take this little cut and paste this little section and put it in 
for, to Elihu's section or into Bildad's section or Zophar's section, right? It, it's another one of these God punishes the wicked. Um, but what Job is pointing out here is he's saying, I know that God will ultimately hold every soul accountable in a way that is absolutely and finally just. In other words, he's saying, I'm not denying anything, or sorry, I'm not denying many of the things that you said. God is absolutely just, and his justice will ultimately and finally uh, be served. And then he points out, it would almost seem like he's contradicting himself, because before, right, he said, hey, the, the wicked, their calves never, you know, the calves always have perfect, ki- uh, perfect what are they called, the progeny, calves, I guess. Their, their cows are always having babies, their livestock, always, their wealth continues, their kids, you know, they keep having kids and so on and so forth. Everything seems to go great for them. But how does, how does that balance against this statement here, can you think? Or is he just contradicting himself, which is possible. Yeah. So he's saying God's justice doesn't always happen right on our timetable. Even if he has many kids, they ultimately come. Even if he has lots of money, he ultimately, you know, uh, it ultimately comes to justice or it's not worth having, right? It's, uh, we've mentioned this before, but, you know, it's amazing to me if money and success is really that good, then wouldn't the... Uh, political elites and Hollywood elites, wouldn't they be living awesome lives? But are they? I see it like it's futility. Like they store up all this money and they place all their their faith in the things of this world and and they die. And they're not remembered. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And then when you look at their lives, they have very frequently, I'm not saying there's not exceptions. In fact, I think they're even godly people in a lot of those spheres, both in terms of the wealthy and, the, and so on. But by and large, right, for all the money and power that they have, their lives are empty, their relationships are ruined, their marriages are falling apart if they even happen, their kids are uh, train wrecks. I mean, as much as they might have, even when they have it, apart from God, it's nothing. It's emptiness. It's, it's hopeless. So Job is saying, look, I'm not saying that God doesn't just uh, judge the the wicked and that the, that the wicked actually win in the long run. So he's reinforcing his faith that God is ultimately just. And the silver lining of that is, is his hope that God will also be uh, just and righteous with, or behave righteously with him. He just doesn't understand how that is. So then we get into chapter 28. And 28 is my favorite, cause, uh, fav- one of my favorites because he begins this extended metaphor against um, uh, about mining, right? So we think about mining today, you know, you might think of people down in coal mines or strip mining or, you know, it's a rather more advanced process, even though it's still pretty grueling for the people who do it. But think about mining in this day, you know, with the limitations on tools and technology. Mining was a perilous, perilous thing, and yet people did it. Um, and so we're kind of trying to, what drove people to undertake such great risk and pain when mining? Wealth. Wealth. Wealth, absolutely. So then he begins kind of a parable here about that. Would someone read uh, 28, 1 through 11? Certainly there is a mine for silver and a place for refining gold. Iron is taken from the dust and copper is smelted from the rock. Man puts the end to the man puts end to the darkness and to the farthest limit he searches out. The rock in the gloom the rock in gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft away from its inhabited area, forgotten by the foot that hang and swing away from people. For earth comes deep, and underneath is it is turned over like fire. It is rocks are, its rocks are the source of sapphires. Its dust contains gold. No bird of prey knows the path, nor has the fal- nor has has the falcon eye caught sight of it. The proud animal has n- have not trodden it, 
nor the lion half ever. He puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the base. He carves out channels through the rocks. His eye sees anything precious. He dams up the streams from the mist flowing and brings the light what is hidden. Right, so, what is his point? That men will go to no end to dig these precious stones, precious metals out of the earth. Because what? They provide riches. They provide wealth. It's worth it to them to risk their lives or give their lives to mine metal out of the earth. Just these shiny rocks. Isn't that interesting? Right? And then he goes into the next section, which is the point of comparison. It's almost like when Jesus tells a parable and then his disciples come and say, what did you mean by that? Well, Job has given the picture, painted the picture of men working and laboring to bring out, uh, to bring forth valuable things from the earth. And then verses 12 through, um, well, 12 through the end of the chapter give us the balance. So would someone like to read that? But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Mankind does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The ocean depth says, it, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of ochre, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of pure gold. Coral and crystal are not to be mentioned, and the acquisition of wisdom is more valuable than pearls. The topaz of Cush cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where, the, where then does wisdom come from, and where is this place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of every living creature, and concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon and Death say, with our ears, we have heard a report of it. God understands its way, and he knows its place. So he looks to the ends of the earth. He sees everything under the heavens. And he imparted weight to the wind and assessed the waters by measure. And he made a limit for the rain and, of course, for the thunderbolt. Then he saw it and declared it. He established it also and searched it out. And to mankind he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Okay, so he's using this this picture of look at the lengths that we'll go to to dig gold from the earth to get precious to become rich basically right and why do we want to become rich? Greed. Greed. Yep, absolutely. Anything else? Security. Yeah. Security. Mm-hmm. Well, and we could say well, yeah. as much security as yeah. you can provide on your own anyway. If you just wanted to have like the most security you could have, how would you paint yourself? Well, being very wealthy in a very safe place and not living, you know, on a fault line. Like basically, those are the things we can do. Can't do everything, but that's that's about our, you know, in a place that floods frequently, <laughs> whatever. Um, but this point that he's making is so we know where to dig to find gold and silver and precious stones. We know where to get that. But where can wisdom be found? So let's talk for a moment about wisdom. Wisdom for us uh, can take on sort of a, a whimsical, almost fanciful feel. Oh, he's a wise man. What does that mean? Is that a fellow you know, wearing a goofy dress and a, and a, with a big long beard? Is that what a wise man is? What is wisdom in your assessment? Or how do you think of wisdom? Yeah, a person, I mean, that's one of the great definitions of wisdom is absolutely uh, knowledge correctly applied, right? So you have, if you had, uh, some, so someone said you had wisdom in woodworking, it means you know how to work wood and you apply that, right? Which are not always the same thing, right? You've got plenty of people who know exactly what they should do, but then they do a foolish thing for whatever reason. They don't follow the principles that they know. It's actually teaching hermeneutics classes. It's one of the saddest things. Hermeneutics, how to study the Bible classes, is because I know I can teach people how to uh, observe and interpret and apply and take the time to actually listen to what God's Word says. 
But much of the time, they won't do it. They'll just think, oh, I know the process, and then they'll read their Bible and say, well, it means what I want it to mean, or it means what I think it means, right? So the, the wisdom of how to read the Bible or how to understand the Bible or hermeneutics is only valuable if you actually apply it. So um, that's a big point. Any other idea about wisdom? Any other ideas we have about wisdom? You know, you know old saying, I think you're wise, you're considered to be wise. Or, because I'm, I'm saying this because I'm Japanese. And also we have tons of Chinese characters, right? And you have to be able to read and you write. If you can do that, you're wise. Mm. You look wise. Yeah. You know, yeah, I like that. So there's that sort of worldly wisdom that has mm-hmm. is either an amassment of knowledge or even um, like a, 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 an encyclopedic understanding of all the proverbs, mm-hmm. whether they're cultural proverbs or whatever else, but just like a person who kind of knows how things fit. My favorite definition of wisdom, uh, as I was studying through the wisdom literature, and Job is part of the wisdom literature, is being skilled at the art of living. Having skill at the art of living. And uh, what I take that to mean is knowing how to live well. And that doesn't necessarily mean knowing how to get rich. So we could say a person might be wise in getting rich or knowing how to you know, uh, get what you want out of people would be being wise in the arts of manipulation. But true biblical wisdom is wisdom in the art of living and how to live in a way that honors God. And so Job is asking a tremendously profound question when he says, where can wisdom be found? Because there's an answer probably on the tip of each of our tongues that wouldn't have been there for Job, right? Where can we find wisdom for living? In the Word of God, of which he did not have. He might have had other uh, methods of of revelation available to him and he might have had other revelation that we no longer have but the reality is is that he's asking a very profound question where is the place of understanding and then he says something really cool he says man does not know its value nor is it found in the land of the living the deep says it is not in me and the sea says it is not with me so here's the fascinating thing when worldly wise men, right? Can you think of any worldly wise men that we still reverence today? I heard alive today? No, 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 just, that like, oh, like ancient oh, that's Yeah, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, these old th- philosophers, modern uh modern philosophers, uh, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, Gandhi. 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 Yep, can Buddha. Buddha. You're our founders. <laughs> Yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson. Now, see, we're going to have... What's that? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. <laughs> a true paragon of wisdom. <laughs> see, the trouble is, when we, even when we get to our founders and, and some of the others, is that they're, they're building on other knowledge. But one of the really interesting books, if you ever get a chance to read, is the Tao Te Ching, which is... Um, yeah. What's that? The Tao Te Ching. What's that? I believe so, yeah. So, uh, I think that... Or Lao Tzu... Oh my, that's embarrassing. The Tao Te Ching is an ancient book of wisdom. It's called The Way. It's, it's about the idea, and it, I don't recommend you read it. It's considered a religious text, and it's certainly not a Christian text. But what it is is a very brilliant uh, brilliant perspective on, again, the Tao Te Ching, the Tao is the way. And so basically, it is wise men, truly, like intelligent men, who sought to, based on the things that they see around them, the way that nature works, how to live correctly, how to live well. I don't recommend it in terms of, uh, as a challenge to, or even a supplement to biblical wisdom. I recommend it because it is a beautiful picture of all that man can accomplish apart from the revelation from God. And it's not much. It's, it's an amazing work, but it is, it is wisdom apart from revelation. You can only know so much apart from revelation. Now, you, I would argue that as you read through the Tao Te Ching or one of these other books of secular ancient wisdom, you'll find things you're like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's right on. He makes a great point. He says, if you want to rule people, you keep their bellies full and their heads empty. It's very simple. If you don't give them too much to think about and you keep them fat, you can control them. 
that'll keep and it's it's focused not on necessarily despotic rule but how do you run a society that's going to work so um confucianism talked about finding order in all things right figuring out how you relate to other things nietzsche looked at the natural world and said it's will just whoever has the strongest will is the one who ultimately runs things and so have the strongest will so nietzsche uh, worships will we could go through david hume and all these who rejected biblical revelation but it's tricky wicket because they actually were mindful of it they just rejected it which is different nevertheless the point that uh, job is making is the deep right the the ocean deeps look and say it's not in me the sea says it is not within me he's pointing out that there's a limitation a great limitation to the revelation or the wit of or the wisdom that we can find in reading the book of nature who put the book of nature into being we call it the book of nature god did right it's created by god so you can definitely observe godly principles but ultimately the true wisdom of god that wisdom which is from above can't be found anywhere in looking at the natural order of the earth and then he points out further it can't be purchased for gold nor can silver be weighed for its price now that's weird because you can use silver and gold to buy a bible you can use silver and gold to buy biblical training right but what is more to the point is just buying a Bible doesn't put the wisdom of it into your heart, into your life. Just going through a class doesn't do a thing for you unless what? You're actually internalizing it, metabolizing it, getting, in, getting it into you. So then he points out that it cannot be valued uh, in the gold of Ophir. So this is a, a very common theme in the Proverbs and throughout. We won't flip to it for interest of time. But... <clears throat> How much do you value wisdom, rhetorically asked? How much, we, how much do we value wisdom? Well, let's just look in our society. If you were to imagine what the most, like if you were to watch TV or watch YouTube videos and have pop-up ads and whatever, what, what are most of the commercials you see about? Beer. Beer or some other alcohol. Uh, Physical yeah. So many drugs, right? When I mean, how often do you see? Hey, if you had diet and exercise and a very re- relatively healthy lifestyle, you wouldn't have to get diabetes medication. No, they're just selling the diabetes medication, right? <laughs> totally disregard wisdom. In fact, please keep eating pizzas because we need to sell this diabetes medication real bad. We got a bunch of it. And then they name like thirty. Side effects. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Showing that we still haven't found wisdom, right? Hmm. What else? Lots of commercials for. Oh, what what do we see commercials for? Oh, what what gets advertised? A lot of environmentalist commercials. Yeah. I'll just get this out and then I skip it. That's right. Yep. The greenies are constantly putting out money to threaten and control cars. So many car commercials. Oh, my goodness. I worked at a car dealership for s- several years, and uh, the statistic that was flying about then, it was a Chrysler Jeep Dodge dealership, uh, was that it takes an estimated $11,000 per customer in, in terms of if you expense out all the advertising. If you walk into a dealership, you cost them walking in $11,000, presuming that you responded to some kind of advertising right that's a lot right just to incite the desire to get a new car um so the point is the world is selling a lot of things it even sells education you see you know come to wgnu or whatever it is you know come to our university our online university come to see us whatever it is so they'll even sell education but interestingly no one's even selling wisdom anymore right when did you ever see a commercial that said, tr- with a true sense, you know, come and take part in this and you will truly live a better life. You'll love your wife, your husband, and your family more. You'll serve your community better. You will uh, be a, a more God-glorifying human being. When have you ever seen that ad? It's just not even sold at this point. It's not even mentioned at this point. Everything is just, this will make you happy. This will make your life better. This will make you look better. This will make you more powerful. This will make you more healthy or less sick. It's all built around selfishness and greed and all those other 
kind of horrifying, uh, ungodly things. And so here, as he points out um, that wisdom is not a thing bought and it's too expensive to sell. The reason why they don't, they don't have ads that for things that will truly you know, enrich you is that that's too expensive a product. It costs you too much because you actually have to give up your pride. You actually have to set aside your perspective. You actually have to abandon your beliefs and your belief, your, our core belief that we're the most important thing in the world to recognize that God is uh, God and his word is correct and we're wrong. That's too high a price to ask people to pay. Hundreds, thousands of dollars. But no, this is uh, true wisdom is purchased by uh, coming with a right orientation to God and his word. And so it points out from where then does wisdom come and where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say we have a report about it with our ears. God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole of heavens and established a weight for the wind and apportioned the waters by the measure. And he made a law for the rain and a path for the thunderbolt. And he saw wisdom and declared it, and he prepared it indeed. He searched it out, and to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, or the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To depart from evil is understanding. It's kind of interesting here because he gives us a little mini uh, preview of what God is going to say authoritatively in just a few chapters' time. This is a wonderful statement because he points out that even though he's flagging in his ability to navigate this situation in his wisdom, he knows that the fear of the Lord is the, is the beginning of wisdom as is so often repeated throughout Book. Now let's think about that. Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? That's, it's such a nice Hallmark card type saying, but what does it mean? To, to approach him humbly and humility. Mm-hmm. Yep. And how is that the beginning of wisdom? Well, because because you take in the word, I mean, you have to understand it. You have no wisdom. You need the Lord's wisdom. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Finn, did you have a comment? Okay. Um, Yeah, that, I mean, that really gets down to the heart of it. If we are going to, (laughs) if we're going to understand rightly what is right and what is wrong and how the world is meant to work, then we have to humble ourselves before the one who made it. I mean, it's easy for us to misunderstand because how else might we gain wisdom in this earth apart from humbling ourselves before the Lord? And I'm not talking about godly wisdom, I'm talking about worldly wisdom. Immerse ourselves in education. Mm-hmm. Could be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. What about the street smarts? You know, some people say, I went to the school of hard knocks, I got my street smarts. What does that mean? Street smarts. I just made a lot of bad decisions along the way. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. We learned on experience. We learned whether positive or negative. Usually if someone says they have street smarts, what do they mean? That they're a scumbag, right? <laughs> like, isn't that what that really means? I got a lot of street smarts. What? So you know how to steal from people? Excellent. You're a piece of trash. God bless you. Uh, but that's right. I mean, that is a kind of wisdom, how to survive in a tough and grisly world that is ugly and filled with theft and murder and, and hardship, right? That is a, a kind of wisdom. But that isn't truly godly wisdom because it's only based upon how to defeat or win against other humans. But godly wisdom gives us that right understanding of who God is, how he created us, what went wrong, and how he fixed it through his own doing. How in our humility we can come to a place of love and support of him and uh, or, and, and right, sorry, right relationship with him. Um, so. Well, in humility too, you understand your reliance upon him. Hmm. Which is important for good living for what reasons? For in what ways? Well, because, I mean, 
life's not easy. So I mean, when you do come on tough times, you know that you need to rely on Him to carry you through that, mm. and His Word and His promises. And and even when things are good, you even need humility that much more mm -hmm. because it's even easier to fall away from Him and think, "Oh, I got this. I can do this on my own." <laughs> Absolutely. And so that's. I mean, I think that's really it. And, and, and I love that he points out that to depart from evil is understanding. Isn't that a cool statement? Like, departing from evil is always wise. In other words, sin is never wise. You ever come to that point like, well, you know, a certain degree of sin is kind of what you need to get by in this world. You need to have a certain amount of slipperiness or a certain amount of uh, violence or a certain amount of wickedness to just to get by in this hard, difficult world. And here Job is cracking this open from the place of having lost absolute everything. He's saying, hey, even in this I know and I can attest that departing from evil is always wise, is always understanding, that life is not about, you know, balancing the good and the bad or the good and the wicked. It's not some sort of disgusting kind of yin-yang experience where you get the good things about you and the dark side of your person. No, walking with God, walking in truth, walking in wisdom is always about living in righteousness. And it doesn't need to be balanced by a secret dark side. It's always wise to walk in wisdom in that way. All right, um, so Job then uh, continues his discourse. Just, let me ask really quick as we come into our final 10 minutes, and I promise our final 10 minutes, um, are you guys full? Are you done, or do you want to push on? I know it's it is ten till. We won't. We probably won't finish everything tonight. But we could go further, or we can uh, we can arrest ourselves at this moment, or we can uh, power on for ten minutes. What? You're done. All right. We're done. We'll pick up next week at uh, chapter twenty nine. It's really a good place to stop because one, I think that Job's discourse on wisdom is one of the most profound chapters of the book, and I'd argue the most profound chapter in the sense that all of the other good stuff that gets said gets said by God. So that's really not much by compare, or that's tough to compare to. Um, so we'll pick up at 29. Whoops. Sorry. We'll pick up at 29 next week, but just with our remaining moments that we've saved, any observations from our study in Job so far or even just the chapters we looked at tonight? Mm-hmm. Great observation. Well, this the circle is when you fear the Lord, that shows that um, you that you have His wisdom. You when you depart from evil, that that shows that you understand His wisdom. It's just like a circle, you know. Because mm -hmm. if you stay in evil. You obviously aren't fearful of the Lord because he could squish you at any moment and mm -hmm. continue to do these things. But if you fear the Lord and his power and everything he can do, that you understand that and just the demonstration of that. Yeah, it's, the, the, the more we live in the fear of the Lord, and actually it's kind of interesting because Psalm 34, I believe, says, Come to me, children, and I will teach you the, the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is something that we learn, right? And that is important because... We don't want to learn the terror or being in terror of the Lord, but we want to learn about a right relationship with Him. That's the whole life process. And the more you choose to fear the Lord, the more you choose to humble yourself and put, get yourself in the Word, the more that benefits. And I think that's really important because so many people complain that their spiritual life is shallow and they will come to sad conclusions like, oh, well, this whole God thing doesn't work. I was like, well, you didn't really go very far, you know? You didn't really experience the growth like it very frequently happens when people have a shallow walk with Christ and then some tragedy hits that they don't go deeper. They, they just pull out entirely because they haven't been walking with him. They haven't been in prayer. They haven't been in the word. And so they wonder why they're not able to endure the, the spiritual trial that's before them when they've got nothing stored up to do so. 
It's like the, the person who, you know, ate a terrible diet of McDonald's and string cheese their whole life and never worked out, and they wonder why they can't run in the Olympics. Of course not. You're living it wrong. So, I yeah. I picture that there's not like a start and a finish to wisdom mm -hmm. and understanding. It continues. Amen. Something I think about um, Jesus is that godly wisdom to the world is foolish. Mm. And by turning away from evil in many cultures throughout history has been foolish or you know uh, looked down upon. In fact, people are killed because of it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, even in our culture right now, like by not indulging in the things that are. Cool right now, like whether it be drug, sex, drunkenness, and everything else. I mean, people look, people look at you weird. Like, mm -hmm. you hear the weirdo when, when ultimately they're, they're the fools. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, look at how does the world view our, pers the biblical perspective on monogamy or heterosexuality, right? They say, oh, you're foolish. What difference does it make, right? To the point where they'll get even violent. Yeah. Exactly, and so the world to uh, the world <laughs> the, the world sees godly wisdom as foolishness. That's right, and we shouldn't be surprised when they do, right? Um, I think sometimes we do act surprised, right, with like the gender bender chaos or all the other garbage that's going on. Why are we surprised? They're disconnected from the word of God. They're disconnected from the wisdom of God. Of course, it's only going to spiral into worse and worse insanity. <laughs> And greater and greater reviling for those who do. Well, I also think very much that it's a hatred for God, and that is mm. God's standard. And they're, and we just see our society right now just trying to turn away from God's standard as hard and as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, we are coming close to the end of our time, so let's close in prayer, and we'll prayers uh, of cadence. Thank you for having the courage to press the stop button. <laughs> Heavenly Father, how we praise you and how we thank you for the wonderful gift of your word, for the wisdom that only you can provide. Lord, you have revealed so much of yourself in the book of nature and, and all that we see around us, but it is only in your word that we see your perfect righteous standard. It is only in your word that we see your grace and your love. It is only in your word that we see the fullest Ex, uh, explanation of yourself in the person of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice which he made for us. We praise you and we thank you for revealing what we would never have figured out and what we could have never have known. Please be glorified in our lives as we continue on in humility and the desire to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>